amazing hardware like this, you know, the, the, the heart of good design. And then th this is like, you know, having a big snot booger come down all over their nose. I don't know what is going through their heads. I don't know why they're doing that. I don't know why uh, they are uh, making it impossible for me to uh, synchronize uh, Outlook with iTunes. It hasn't been possible for two or three years now, and they just kind of forgot about it, I guess. Um, how did we get to this place? How do we get to the state where, uh, for example, there's this, there's this thing now that's been really fashionable for two or three years now, DevOps. You know something is fashionable when people leave a bunch of syllables off stuff. DevOps. What's DevOps? DevOps is where we have this amazing new idea that developers and operations people Developers and the operations people should work together to accomplish the goals of the business. How screwed up did things have to be before that started looking like an amazing, interesting, relevant new idea? What is wrong with our business? I think it starts with the fact that some people have strange ideas about software development. They think of this as efficiency. And it, it, to a very significant degree, it is. That is very efficient, isn't it? But they forget something. They forget that the product that is being assembled here, not, constru not uh, designed, not uh, uh, developed, but assembled. They're thinking about the assembly part. And they forget that the product was designed. And they also forget that the factory in which all this efficiency happens had to be built. And they also forget that the factory itself had to be designed and built. They're focused on the efficiency of slapping a bunch of stuff together that has already been designed. Plus, it's important for us to remember that software development is not the part where we're putting stuff together. It's the part where we design the thing that we're going to copy. If software development were like manufacturing, then the, it seems to me that what we'd be paying attention to, you know, the thing that's most fascinating about manufacturing is watching all those machines make all those copies of that original thing. But That's not the interesting part in software development. Software development is where we design the first thing. The interesting part about software development is not the copy command. It's not the assembly line. It's the design studio. Plus, did you notice anything missing from those pictures? No people in them. So the people with those funny ideas, they forget that people do all this stuff, right? They, go, they become fascinated with the machinery. They become fascinated with the repetitious process, the part that doesn't involve design, that doesn't involve uh, um, the uh, creation of innovative new things. They get fascinated by the copy process. Software development is not factory work. It's not about the part about where we make a million copies of the same thing. Designs have to be developed. We call it software development for that reason. And designs have to be interpreted. Somebody makes a design and other people uh, involved with that uh, try to figure out how to turn this design into, into something real, something that people can use. And putting things together is often complicated and messy, even when the parts that we're putting together have themselves been well designed. People forget that whenever we're building something for the first time, even building a model of it can be messy. What they see when they see the finished product is they don't see the mess. They don't see the sawdust and the spilled glue and the drawings that have been crumpled up on the paper and thrown out. What they see 
And I, I, I owe this idea to a, a fellow named Harry Collins, whose uh, name will come up again pretty soon. What they see is a ship in a bottle. Now, Harry Collins says this about the process of science. What most people see from science is the ship in the bottle. They see the thing already built, already assembled. They don't see the snapped masts and the broken hinges and the spilled glue and the, the trial versions of this that didn't fit into the bottle. They just see the bottle sitting up there on the mantelpiece and they think, oh, isn't that cool? But they don't really think about how it got there and how messy a process that can be. They forget what happens when you try to do too much too quickly. This has to be fake. I, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's cool, but I, it's got to be fake. Um, for one thing, the shadows don't work quite right. Um, but it's, it's, it's a nice, it's a cool picture. Um, this one, though, is real. <laughs> this actually happened. Um, and that's what happens when you try to drive too quickly without driving sufficiently carefully. What we don't pay a lot of attention to in, in uh, testing and in uh, uh, development work is how we develop products and how we develop skill, how we learn stuff, and how much of what we learn is tacit, not stated, not made explicit, uh, not written down in any requirements document, not learned in from any book, not explained, not told. We learn stuff by doing stuff, by trying stuff, by experimenting with stuff, by screwing up. We also learn by being immersed in a culture where people are doing the things that we're doing. We're, we're watching people. As we, as we grow up, uh, as in fact, as Harry Collins said of, uh, of uh, the business of riding a bicycle, we all learn to ride a bicycle, right? Most of us know how to ride a bicycle. Everybody who knows how to ride a bicycle, sure. But imagine, he says, growing up on a desert island, or you've never seen a bicycle before. Imagine what that's like. You've never seen a bicycle before, and somebody puts a bicycle in front of you, and they said, here, uh, ride it. This is for riding on. Well, you wouldn't believe it possible, right? You, in fact, you'd have a lot of questions right away. That would, okay, so which one of the two round things do I stand on, right? That's what you, you'd want to know, because... You wouldn't even know how to get on the bicycle. And in fact, your first few experiments trying to ride the bicycle would prove to you that riding a bicycle is not possible. It, you'd fall over. Uh, you wouldn't know uh, where to put your feet. You wouldn't know where to put your weight. You wouldn't have seen anybody riding a bicycle before. And so you would not believe such a thing possible. You'd do a couple of experiments and you'd say, well, this, this can't be done. We learn far more and far more quickly from our own practice, from making mistakes, from screwing up, and from feedback, and from loops of feedback, loops of learning, loops of experimenting. And one of the things I want to emphasize about this is that there's a, a style, there's an approach to testing that's very common these days. A, a way of thinking about testing that's very common, which worries me a lot. And that is the idea that testing is confirming things, showing that something works, uh, creating a suite of automated checks that make the program do something, and then apply decision rules to observations about what the program did, and then uh, set off an alarm, an alert, any time a check fails. And then when all the checks are running green, we be happy. And we say we can ship. But that worries me. That worries me a lot. It worries me because no number of passing checks can show that a program will work or that it does work. All, it, all those checks do is that they show that a program can work. We'll return to that point a little bit later on. 
We get nervous, you see, when testing reveals that there's a problem someplace. And we'd prefer not to make mistakes. I mean, that's a kind of natural thing. That's sort of, sort of built into our upbringing. Uh, we're uh, uh, told that making mistakes is bad. You know, we're marked down for it in school. I remember an interview one time with a woman who uh, uh, was honored by her students. Uh, the reason that she was honored by her students was because every time a student would uh, uh, pass a test, every time a student would get something right, the teacher would not pay a whole lot of attention. She said, that's very good. Well done. But whenever somebody would get something wrong, the teacher would get all excited and say, good job. You learned something when you did that. When you got it wrong, you learned something. And getting something right, when I, when I am successful at something, I rarely learn <laughs> to the degree that I do when I mess something up, when I screw it up. So mistakes are normal when we're learning how to do different, uh, different things, and mistakes are how we learn. Of course, problems happen even when we're not trying to do difficult, uh, difficult things. There's another thing that goes on that bugs me about the way people look at testing these days. They think of it in terms of a numbers game. It's easy for people to become fixated on charts, dashboards, numbers. I did this myself with my mad PowerPoint skills, you know. Uh, uh, well, not PowerPoint, it's just cut and paste. And see, it's a KPI dashboard. Look, there's the hours worked, uh, but the motivation is going down to nothing. The working features are at zero. Thousands of lows, everything's being measured in thousands of lines of code. Why are people so fixated on uh, looking at the dashboard instead of looking out the window, and looking around? Why don't people notice this? <laughs> that you can recognize some really important things without numbers. I mean, is there a problem here? No, wait. It, oh, hang on. We can't. We don't, we don't know if there's a problem unless we uh, measure the temperature in here, right? <coughs> Until we get some numbers to prove that there's a problem. I would like to uh, uh, emphasize to those people with these funny ideas about how software is developed and built that numbers are not the story. The numbers are illustrations to the story. They help shine light on certain parts of the story, but they are not the story themselves. I also, when I got this picture, I love the fact that the answers that the kid is writing down are wrong. That's kind of, that's kind of fun. Does it help, for example, to count test cases? Some of you, I bet, work in organizations where they do that. Not only do they count test cases, but they count the ratio of passing test cases to failing test cases. I wonder why that happens. Uh, pilots don't use piloting cases. Parents don't use parenting cases. Uh, scientists, researchers don't use science cases. And uh, by the way, at those very same companies where they count test cases like crazy, managers don't use management cases either. So why do testers use test cases? I have a theory. Why do testers use test cases? Some people are giggling. Why do testers use test cases? It's okay. You can talk. It's not church. It's all right. <laughs> I've got a weird energy today, too, by the way. I've been uh, 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 talking all day long and uh, working with testers all day long. But why do testers use test cases? To test the features? To be sure you test right. A set of instructions, a procedure. Okay, but pilots don't use piloting cases. They follow procedures all the time. You can see the coverage. Is that the only way you can see coverage? You, when you're designing checks, it might be reasonable to identify certain conditions that are being checked, absolutely. Not to miss something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Do test cases ever miss anything? I think I understand. I mean, uh, 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 do programmers use programming cases? Not the same kind of way testers use test cases, do they? Uh, oh, sometimes. Sometimes we use use cases. Do you like use cases? I love use cases. Use cases are fantastic. I love them. I love them. Use cases are so great because there's always a set of preconditions that have been fulfilled, right? And everybody in a use case does exactly what they're supposed to do. Have you ever noticed that? They always do exactly the stuff they're supposed to do in the right order. Nobody ever sneezes. Nobody ever gets interrupted. Nobody's ever under any pressure from their boss. They all do exactly the right things in exactly the right order. They use appropriate data at just the right time. Uh, they never are being distracted. Uh, in a use case, have you ever noticed, in a use case, nobody ever gets a Skype notification, right? Nobody ever has a Slack window pop up on them, right? Uh, uh, their machine never goes to sleep while they were up talking to somebody else. That never happens in a use case. Never, ever, ever, ever happens in any use case that I've ever seen. And nobody ever misuses the product. That's what we need as testers, I, I think. We need more misuse cases. Nobody ever tries to hack into the system. We need abuse cases. Test cases are too restrictive. They're too tight. We need loose cases. So why do testers use uh, test cases? I have a theory. My theory is the managers like test cases because they make testing legible. They make testing readable, understandable. It turns testing into nice little widgets that we can pop out of the test case production machine. And testers keep talking about test cases because managers keep asking about them. Because testers keep talking about them. Because managers keep asking about them. Because testers keep talking about them. Because managers keep asking about them. Because testers keep talking about them. Because managers keep asking about them. Because testers keep talking about them. Because managers keep asking about them. But I think smart people can do much better than that. So uh, around 2009, August uh, 2009, uh, I started making a distinction, which to some degree has caught on, and uh, I found it helpful. And uh, lots of other people have found it helpful, too. I want to get serious about what testing is. I want, to get, I want people to get excited about what testing is and not making, the, not making it this rote procedural kind of thing. And I want to start getting excited about how we can use tools more powerfully. Not just for this. Let's call this checking and not testing. Let's call it operating a product algorithmically. Now, this is an older version of this uh, uh, slide. There's a new updated version of this slide that includes the keyword algorithmically and that emphasizes that at each stage of this process, Operating and observing the product, interacting with the product algorithmically in specific ways to collect specific observations. Evaluating the product by applying algorithmic decision rules to those observations and alerting the user or the tester uh, to a problem by reporting algorithmically any failed checks. Operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it. That's what I and my community means when we talk about checking. Now, there's nothing wrong with checking. Checking is cool. Checking is a good thing. Checking lives inside testing. There are three parts to a check. Observation, link to a decision rule, such that they can both be applied with algorithms. That is to say, by a program, we can get machinery to do it, which means that a check can be performed by a machine that cannot think, but which does have the virtue of being very fast, very precise, very tireless. You can get the machine to do it over and over again. 
or a check can be performed by a sufficiently disengaged human being. A human being who has been told, oh, don't think, just follow the procedure. Make these specific observations, look for these specific outputs, and then mark it fail. If it is inconsistent, if the output is inconsistent with the uh, predicted output. But testing is so much more than that. Testing is, well, let's start with what checking is. Checking is about confirmation. Checking is about verifying things. Things that we believe to be true or hope to be true or that we wish were true. But problems can exist in a program even when all the checks come out correct. And there are all kinds of ways in which humans can make judgments about the product that don't really have anything to do with pass or fail. Well, for instance, for instance, for instance, here's one. Square root of 2. 1.4142136. Is that correct? Well, I, was, it's li I love being in the eastern uh, uh, part of the world because uh, they always get this right. 1.4142136. Is that correct as the square root of 2? It's all right. You can use tools if you want. Yeah, you can whip out the, you know, whip out the iPhone there and have a look. Is it correct? Close. Uh, so not correct. Not correct? Correct or not correct? <laughs> Good answer. Uh, although, uh, it depends. It's never satisfactory to a context-driven tester. It depends on what? What does it depend on? On what? On the environment? Requi on the requirement. What I'm talking about in, in straightforward mathematical terms is 1.4, 1.4, 1.4142136, the square root of 2. It's close is a, a wonderful answer to that. Because uh, for me to give you the correct square root of 2, I would have to talk all night and then forever. So it's not correct but it's good enough. And we can make a human judgment about whether it's good enough. Uh, here's what a machine will not do. A machine will not say, 4142136, ah, close enough. Unless the machine has been programmed explicitly to do that. Or, unless by coincidence, uh, it's a 64 or 128 bit precision calculation being done by the same algorithm on two different machines, and the result comes back, and it's right down to this something de decimal point. Right? It's consistent. But that's not to say it's right, but it's not to say it's wrong either. Close enough is a wonderful way of putting it, but only a human can make that judgment, or only a machine that it, uh, uh, has been programmed by a human can make that judgment. Then there's all kinds of other things that uh, uh, machines won't make judgments about. They'll just make a calculation. There's a big difference between calculation and evaluation. Sometimes we use those words as to mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. So, that's what checking is. What is testing? Well, testing contains, among many other things, checking. Checking is contained within testing. Checking is the part of testing that involves operating a product algorithmically to check algorithmically, algorithmically specific facts about it. But testing, in the rapid software testing way of looking at things, is evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation. And that includes a lot of stuff. It includes, to some degree, 
modeling, questioning, studying, manipulating the product and observing it, collaborating with other people, identifying resources. It involves generating ideas, elaborating on ideas, refining ideas that we've elaborated on, overproducing ideas, uh, abandoning ideas that we've overproduced, recovering ideas that we've abandoned. It involves creating and applying tools. It involves uh, 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 evaluating comparable products. It involves trying to make inferences, trying to make conjectures about what might happen. And it especially involves the design of experiments. That's way more than just checking. In, in fact, uh, testing also involves identifying risks that might prompt us to encode a check. Of course, testing also includes even more than that. Testing involves creating the conditions necessary to do all that stuff so that we can help our clients make informed decisions about risk. But actually, when we think about it, testing is even more than that. Testing requires us to develop the skill, the desire, the inclination, the credibility, the reputation to create the conditions necessary to evaluate a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation. And if we do all that well, maybe we can help make the product better too. All this is why I say we cannot automate the testing. This is a part of testing that we can op automate, the operations part, but we can't get automation to design good, relevant, useful checks. We can't get automation to interpret checks. We can't get automation to decide whether people are going to be satisfied with the difference between what this program does and what it could do, or what a human in the same place would do. <laughs> and I worry about that. I worry about it a lot because uh, more and more we're giving over responsibility for, for stuff to algorithms. Example a few weeks ago in uh, the United States, I forget where I was. I was somewhere in Europe. I think it was in England. Uh, the um, uh, That uh, infamous uh, United Airlines flight where the guy got dragged off the plane because some algorithm said him, her, her, and him. They get off the plane. And he's a doctor. And he's old. He's 69 years old. And he's He's going somewhere. He's got to be in Cincinnati. Uh, uh, he's going from Cincinnati to Lexington, I think. He's got to be in Lexington the next day. He's got patients to see. And he really, really, really doesn't want to get off the plane. So they bring in the cops to drag him off, and they mess off his mouth. He's dragged off bleeding, and he comes back sort of in a haze at one point and manages to get back on the plane. They drag him off again. Well, I think the gate agent who was involved that night probably learned something. But the algorithm did not, because the algorithm has no social engagement. The algorithm is not a social agent. The algorithm is not part of society. The algorithm feels no guilt, no shame, no dismay. People do. Oscar Munoz, the, the head of United Airlines, you know, he was uh, the CEO. He was slated to become a chairman of the board. He was going to be, you know, uh, promoted to get uh, the chairman of the board. He was going to take a seat on the board. And some person on Twitter, uh, this is so clever, I <laughs> wish I'd thought of this, uh, it, it, he didn't get his promotion, right? Didn't get promoted uh, because of this incident. 
And some person on Twitter said, God, can you imagine that? Not getting a seat that you thought you were going to get. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> we can't automate the testing because testing is involved with human stuff. We can use tools in powerful ways for sure. For sure. But we can't automate the testing. And here's my... Uh, my little uh, uh, diversion into why I think we can't automate the testing. But in order for me to deliver it to you, I'm going to need your help. I, I've, I've been meaning to memorize this for some time, I don't, I, so I'm going to have to read it, unfortunately. But I need your help. Uh, can you do that? Can you? Okay. See, my wife and my daughter and I all got obsessed with Hamilton, this uh, musical. Right, it was the first Broadway musical that's done uh, pretty much entirely in rap. Okay, now you got to keep, got to keep on the beat here. You can't speed up. You can't slow down. Got to keep me. Mm, mm, okay, this is why, this is why testing can't be automated. This is all the things that machines can't do. Okay, experimentation, learning, freestyle exploration. Studying and modeling, conjecture, observation, test code development, task prioritization, checking out competitors, preparing simulations, reconciling your testing with required regulations, gathering, assessing, and applying information, deliberation, judgment, designing visualizations, setting up the lab to try complex configurations, working out the problems in a puzzling situation, finding ambiguity in a product specification, trying to look beyond the predicted expectation. That's because testing's all about investing. Investigation, questioning and learning, playful product interaction, trying to keep your focus while you're managing distraction, sense making, myth breaking, decision making, no faking, stressing out the product to discover where it's breaking, refining test approaches through deliberate practice. How could hackers hack this? Don't give them access. Sense making, myth breaking, decision making, no faking, stressing out the product to discover where it's breaking. I have interrupted, disrupted because the product's full of bugs. The fellas who developed it must have been on drugs. Talking with the managers to learn what they require. Testing for charisma. That's what customers desire. So I shall socialize to promote collaboration. Other folks can help me with my testing preparation. Working with the marketers to see the fast power. Point to all the features. Try to finish in an hour. Selecting, configuring, and then applying tools. Applying critical thinking. Confirmation is for fools. Refactoring at every step. Keeping things maintainable. Let's get over overtime and make the pace sustainable. Building coverage models. Analyzing risk, eliminating waste, trying to keep the pace brisk. Pattern recognition, distributed cognition, helping shy colleagues get over inhibition. I want to say this while I'm in a rap rhythm. A check's a part of testing encoded in algorithm. Testing's much more than automatic checks and test cases. Human variation puts the product through its paces. Use tools powerfully. That's what I'm suggesting. But don't try to tell me you can automate the testing. <laughs> my uh, uh, my daughter uh, uh, I, my, my daughter was my, my my test bed for that particular thing. She she approved, and so I I knew uh, I knew I was in good shape. All right, now how to get what you want from testing? How to get what you want from testing? It seems to me. Uh, it's really important for us as uh, testers and for us as developers and for us as product managers to get value from testing. It, it, I think that as the uh, uh, testing community, we're not as good as we might be in trying to figure out how to do that, uh, how to bring value to the team. And one of the problems with it is that uh, the value that we bring is kind of like the value that a smoke detector brings. You know, I mean, the most uh, smoke detectors, in my experience, are mostly annoying. <laughs> because uh, often uh, they draw your attention to stuff that uh, you already know about. Um, to the degree, in fact, that at our house we call it the cooking detector. <laughs> Uh, uh, we've had two fires in the kitchen. Well, two times when we've seen flames, right? 
One was in the toaster oven, and the other time a pan, uh, some grease caught fire in the pan, and you know, all the flames, and it was really dramatic. But we were all cool with it, you know, just get the baking soda out of the fridge and put it on the pan, and we're done with it. In neither case did our smoke detector go off. But if I want to grill a steak, or if I want to bake some olive bread, eh, 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 eh. so we need either the really tall stepson to go in and reach the thing, or I have to get a broom and try to jam it up and shut the damn thing off. Sometimes testers can be like that, right? Sometimes testers can tell us about stuff uh, that we already know and that we don't really uh, need to know. When do you need a smoke detector? You need a smoke detector when other people might be falling asleep. You need a smoke detector to draw your attention to invisible things. But, of course, you don't necessarily know when that's going to happen. So it, it, testers are kind of like insurance or, or smoke detectors. We don't actually bring value to the project as such much of the time. What we do is we defend the value that's there. We help to defend the value that's there by recognizing things that other people wouldn't be able to recognize uh, without our help. Not so easily, anyway. Oh, they could do it, but they're busy. They're busy. The programmers are busy programming, and the designers are busy designing, and the, the documentation people are busy documenting. And it's our job as testers to investigate and explore risk, and that requires a different mindset. I think, because the builders are in one mindset, and I don't know about you, but when I'm building something, it's really hard for me to notice two kinds of problems, little itty-bitty problems that are just sort of annoying, and big problems with my design and with my model. When I'm writing something, when I'm uh, uh, writing code, if I'm thinking about all the time, if I'm thinking all the time about how it could go wrong, I would just drive myself neurotic. But there's a really, really efficient way for me to find out if something is wrong, and that is to show it to somebody else and to invite them, to ask them, would you please look at this from a critical perspective? Can you tell me what's wrong with this thing for you? Can you enter that role, that testing role for me? And that doesn't mean that they have to be a, a full-time tester or even a person with a job called tester, but they, they need to put on the testing hat. Testing hat. For a few minutes. A, it, being a tester is not like having a full-body tattoo. Right? A tester is a, is a hat that you put on. And uh, I can prove it. Because <laughs> a lot of people say, well, you know, developers. The reason we can't have developers doing the testing is because developers aren't very good testers. And bullshit. That's not true at all. You want to see a developer doing great testing? First thing to do is just watch them working because they're trying little things all the time. They're trying little experiments. They're learning from that. They're feeding it back into their own process. So developers spend an enormous amount of their time doing testing anyway. It's part of the process of building something. But the trouble is, like everybody else, developers are not perfect testers. They're not perfect evaluators of their own code of their own product, of their own design, that's okay. But even another developer with the testing mindset, coming at that product with the, the object of finding problems in it, <laughs> if it's somebody else's code they're looking at, oh, watch them turn into amazing testers right away. They'll go medieval on that person's code. So developers are excellent testers. Let's put that on the table. But there's a, something that developers might not have, that testers might have a little more of. Developers might not have a lot of critical distance, distance away from the work, and distance away from the developer's mindset, from the builder's mindset. And a lot of reasonably significant, important, but to some degree shallow testing is easily tractable at close critical distance. Uh, programmers will tend to find programmer-oriented kinds of problems, coding problems, communication problems between modules in the product. But they won't necessarily find it easy to get way out of programmer land into a, a, a mindset that's unlike regular programmer stuff. 
I mean, testers are geeks too. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I don't want to uh, be uh, uh, too, um, uh, I don't want to make this a, to be too sweeping a generalization, but when you've got somebody whose job it is to think critically about software, to shine light on all the ways in which the software might have uh, problems with it, that's, I think, a powerful heuristic for getting quickly into a place where we can see problems in the product. In other words, that's my role. That's a testing role. My role is to investigate the software with a particular focus on looking for problems. And in order to do that, I train myself to find problems. I study how people can make uh, um, uh, critical thinking errors, uh, common logical fallacies that they can apply. I try to develop complex models of how uh, software is built and uh, how software might be tested. I think about coverage. I think about bugs. I think about issues. I think about oracles. So there's some important words for us. Yeah, yeah, there we go. A bug. A bug is any problem that threatens the value of the product. <laughs> or more informally, a bug is something that bugs somebody who matters. An issue is anything that threatens the value of the testing project or of the overall project or of the business. Coverage is how much you've tested based on some model. Oracle is something that helps you to recognize a problem when it happens during testing. So how can we as te testers make our value more apparent more easily? And I think a big part of it involves this. As testers, it's important for us to tell a story in three parts three strands in this braid here that weave around each other. Not, not uh, written out one, two, three. These are the three parts of the story, but they're not necessarily told in order. They weave around each other like the, the plot lines in a really good novel. The first story is a story about the status of the product. What it is, what it does, how it works, how there might be hidden value in it, that value that's sort of below the surface, alternative ways of using the product. And then how it doesn't work, how it fails, how it might fail in various kinds of conditions and in ways that might matter to our client. That's the first part, the first level testing story. The second, and that's a story largely, by the way, about bugs. The second level testing story is the story about how the product was tested, how we've tested the product, what we've been doing to configure, operate, observe, and evaluate it, how we have determined the difference between problem and no problem, how we've recognized problems. That is a story about oracles. An oracle is a means by which we recognize a problem when we encounter one in testing. Another part of the how we tested it story is shining light on the parts of the product that we haven't tested yet. And the kinds of testing we haven't done, the kinds of coverage that we have not obtained. What we've covered with testing and what we have not yet covered and what we might not cover at all unless things change in ways that matter to our clients. So that when the client comes along six months later and says, why didn't you test this? Didn't you find, or why didn't you find that bug? Didn't you test it? And we can say, uh, no, we didn't, because we decided together back six months ago. Remember when? We decided that there was more important stuff, in our opinion. We, that is to say, you, dear product manager, and I, we worked this out together, and we made our best faith, best faith effort. We thought that this was the most important uh, stuff to test, and maybe it still was, but this bug got past us. All of us, not just past the testers. See, testers are kind of like goalies in a game of soccer, right? <laughs> uh, if the game of soccer, if you're losing 15-0 uh, in a game of soccer, isn't it the case that there's more problems than just with the goalie, almost certainly? It's our job as a team to try to identify ways to make testing go 
faster and easier because that will make the project go faster and easier too. So that's what the third level testing story is about. How good our testing is and what gets in the way of it and what makes it harder and what makes it slower. And one of the things that makes testing harder and slower, remarkably, is a buggy product. When there are lots of bugs in the product, testing is way harder and way slower. Why? Because we're spending all our time writing bug reports instead of obtaining coverage. See, uh, I get this from a lot of people, especially in agile uh, uh, development shops, and I, I'm having a hard time understanding why it's so. Because um, from the Agilistas, I often get this thing, well, we have to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of automated unit tests, automated integration tests, automated user acceptance tests, by which they mean checks, of course. Lots and lots of automated checking. Why? Well, because there's, uh, 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 we have to do all this regression testing on every build. Why do you have to do that? Well, because we keep finding that there's regression problems. And why are there regression problems, right? I, sometimes I feel like a four-year-old. Why are there regression problems, Daddy? <laughs> uh, there are regression problems because the developers are going so fast that they don't, uh, you know, they break stuff a lot. I don't know about you, but I seem to remember something in the Agile principles about this whole sustainable pace thing. It seems to me what people are really saying when they're saying that is development is going so fast, we don't have a chance to keep track of what we're actually doing. <laughs> we don't have a handle on what we're doing. That's why the product could break anywhere, and we don't know where it's going to break. Well, I think that is a risky strategy. Maybe, maybe a pattern of consi a consistent pattern of regression problems is not uh, something that we have to put up more smoke alarms for. We know that the building's already pretty smoky. Uh, we know that uh, the building is made out of uh, very old, uh, dry wood, and uh, there are uh, open flames all over the place, and, and buckets of gasoline, and uh, 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 piles of oily rags in the corner and uh, a bunch of arsonists running around throwing matches all over the place and people smoking in bed. Maybe it might be a good idea to slow down and clean up the mess just enough that we can proceed with more safety. The solution, it seems to me, towards complex, uh, difficult uh, uh, to test products is not to set up more automated regression checks. It seems to me a, a safer approach, because the automated regression checks, they're not going to find everything either. A safer approach is to slow down a little bit so that the product can go as fast as it can safely, not simply as fast as it can. Uh, you won't get from here to the airport at 250 kilometers per hour, no matter how many airbags you put in the car. Right? There is a certain limit at which it's sane to could try to drive across the city and get to the airport, and then there's a limit at which you're taking on uh, unsupportable risk. So, it seems to me that testers aren't too bad at telling that part of the story, the first part of the testing story. It seems to me that testers are actually not that great at telling the second level testing story, what's been tested and how it's been tested, and they're not very good at all, it seems to me, by and large, at talking about what parts of the product are yet as yet uncovered by testing and what testing is important and which could be done. Now, it's not the tester's job to decide that it must be done. That's not our job. We don't run the project. We don't drive the bus. We're the bus driver's friend. It's our job. It's our job to uh, let the bus driver know about things that the bus driver may not have thought of, may not have noticed. And uh, uh, parts of the product or approaches to testing the product or models of the product that are untested 
that's something that I think we should be talking about. Now, if testers aren't very good at that, they're downright miserable at the third part. The quality of the testing story, how good our testing was, why the testing we've been doing is the most fabulous testing we could possibly have been doing. And to the degree that it is not, why testing is harder or slower. why the product we're making might not be the most testable product possible. Uh, what we need and what we recommend in order to make a more testable product, uh, logging, visibility, modularity, all the things that will help the developers go faster too. And I don't think uh, uh, testers are, are, are really at all good at talking about that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, partly for, uh, uh, the partly because they're, they're they're not mandated to do it. Nobody asked them to do it. And partly because testers uh, uh, very often don't have the kind of technical sophistication that they could have. And I'm not saying that every tester has to be a programmer. I'm not saying that every tester has to write code. I'm not saying that every tester has to be, even has to be technical, although it's a really good idea for testers not to be intimidated by technology. I am saying that testers need analytical skills in scientific thinking, in critical thinking, in general systems thinking, and in analysis that they very uh, often, sadly, uh, do not have. So one of the things I, I am trying to do is uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage uh, testers to develop those skills uh, and to, uh, uh, to bring from all over the place uh, stuff that the craft of testing and the craft of software development needs to hear from outside because we don't get it very much on the inside. So that story is a story about issues, things that threaten the value of the testing. And uh, as testers, I, I think we kind of need to get better at that. Now, what do I still have to talk about that I can get over with quickly so we can go drink beer? Because I know, it, I know that's important. Why don't I do this? Uh, uh. Here's some heuristics. Uh, this will do. Uh, so we can go drink beer. Uh, here's some uh, heuristics, some uh, ideas that might work, uh, might fail. Uh, but here's a heuristic for getting what we want. Let's change we have to to we choose to. That's as a start. Like, for example, people say we have to automate. Well, we don't have to automate. I don't think we have to automate. We might want to automate. We might choose to automate. We might choose to use tools. But I'm not sure that automation is, simp is uh, the one and only way to use uh, uh, tools in, in testing. Not at all sure, but boy, does that ever get all the talk. I want to think about how we could use tools uh, to, for example, uh, generate and add variation to test data. I want to talk about how we can use tools for visualization, for showing uh, uh, statistical patterns, for helping with analysis. I want uh, testers to be able to use tools to uh, search and sort and filter and manipulate and reconfigure uh, uh, test data and uh, results, test results. I would like uh, testers to be able to use tools uh, in order to make testing itself go more quickly. Not the checking part, but configuration of test systems, setting test systems up. Uh, I would like testers to uh, uh, develop the skills to uh, uh, write little tiny snippets of code that will help them get useful stuff done. And I would like testers to learn how to ask developers for that. The reason I would like them to do that, another reason I would like them to do that, is because of the social value of doing that. There's no way to make better friends with a developer uh, in many cases uh, than to say to that developer, would you teach me something about that thing that you're doing all the time that you're really interested in doing? That allows us to achieve close social distance at the same time as we can maintain uh, critical distance. So instead of saying we have to automate, uh, one of the things we could say is, well, we could choose to automate. 
we could choose to develop other ways to use tools powerfully in testing as well. Let's not forget about those. But we have to do complete regression testing on every build. No, you don't. You choose to. And it might be a good idea to do that unless and until the programmers learn to defend against regression risk, which programmers can do, uh, which the testers can absolutely help with uh, by advocating for testability, by adv advocating for modularity, for uh, controllability, scriptable interfaces, uh, visibility, uh, uh, log files, and, and uh, uh, means by which we can probe the internal state of the pro uh, product, configurability, allowing us to make changes rapidly to the uh, uh, configuration and to the internal state of the program so we can get the program to confess its bugs to us. So that's my answer to that one. Mind you, there's another dimension to that, and that is uh, programmers probably need help. Not just getting the resource, they kind of know how to do unit level testing. They don't have the time to do it. And the reason they don't have the time to do it is because uh, uh, they're pressured. They're under pressure too, like testers are. Uh, programmers are under pressure to produce code. Mm, it'd be nice if they were under pressure to produce code that works, and if they were, the dynamic would change a little bit. Because then the programmers would say, hang on, I don't want to be pushed. I don't want to be rushed into the schedule. Uh, programmers like, like testers have been trained to say yes. And somebody says, so can you get this out by Thursday? Yes. Well, you know, if you don't know how to say no or not yet, your yes really doesn't mean anything. That's a line from Jerry Weinberg, which goes along with this one, is if it doesn't have to work, you can meet any other requirement. <laughs> you can meet any deadline. You can have a feature list as long as your arm, as long as it doesn't have to work, everything's okay. You can meet that. Uh, I would like testers to become better students of risk and uh, uh, to have a nice crisp story that they can tell about risk. Uh, here's the story we tell about risk. Some person, somebody, some victim will suffer loss or harm or annoyance or diminished value because of vulnerability in the product that is triggered by some threat. I would like testers to become better analysts of risks uh, and uh, uh, point to problems not only in the product, but to the fact that we might be unaware of problems in the product and therefore uh, uh, different models and different uh, uh, applications of, of coverage might be a good thing, but also problems in the project and unawareness of problems in the project. I would like testers to help with that. Here's this picture again. Hmm. If you see a consistent pattern of regression, any given bug is not your biggest problem. The problem is that you've got a regression-friendly environment. You've got a favorable environment for the product to backslide. And maybe the project is going too fast for us to keep track of. And one of the things I want, one of the things I know risk lives in is a project where there are large bits of it, large parts of it that, do, that I don't understand. Uh, where I'm going so fast that my testing is, is by necessity shallow, where the product is so untestable that my testing is by necessity shallow. So we can advocate for that. So how do we get what we want? One, let's get everybody in the same room. Let's get everybody in the room where it happens, as they say in Hamilton. Uh, let's emphasize everybody working together constantly instead of occasionally meeting. I, my favorite kind of environment is one where I'm on the other side of the uh, uh, um, of the carol from the uh, uh, from the developer, where the developer is working right beside me, where I'm working right beside the developer. Uh, there might be a test lab down the hall that I wander to occasionally, but most of the time I want to be riding right next to the developer uh, in the front seat of the car. Uh, let's uh, do what the agilist suggests and build little tiny changes in, and look at them and analyze them and test them. 
and provide super fast feedback to the programmers. Uh, let's uh, test immediately after we get something to test. And by the way, you know, uh, well, let's do this really quickly. Why not? Let's remember that our notions of product and our notions of testing uh, historically have been kind of messed up. Here's how they've been messed up. We're making a product, they say to the testers. We need you to start testing it right now. So what do you do? I, I didn't think it was like that. I thought you prepared test cases. And then you execute test cases. Isn't that how you do it? Oh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you read the spec. And you identify specific items to be checked. And then you prepare test cases. And then you execute test cases. Right? Right? No, people are saying no. Oh, so we read the spec. Oh, my God, there is no spec. <laughs> Oh, wait, there is a spec. I found it. It's like some dusty corner of the server someplace. I'll just read it. Oh, my God, it's old and it's confusing and it's out of date and it contradicts itself and maybe it's wrong. So, oh, I, oh okay, wait, wait. Don't panic. Don't panic. I'll just go over and I'll ask somebody. <laughs> oh, my God, nobody here knows what this thing's supposed to do or how it's supposed to work. Is there something, anything that I can test? And the answer is, you're absolutely right. There's always something you can test. You can test the idea. Because when I talk about testing as exploration and experimentation, I'm not just talking about a finished product. I'm talking about an idea. Or maybe a prototype. Maybe a mock-up. Maybe a specification. Maybe a document. I can perform thought experiments on an idea. Somebody comes to me with an idea, and I can say, hmm, how might that not work? Right? Somebody comes to me with a, a prototype, and I say, well, what does this prototype represent? Uh, how does the prototype not do the thing that it's supposed to do? And in fact, come to think of it, how might the prototype and the actual product not match up with each other? Or when somebody comes to me and says, uh, I want you to test this right away. Well, what kind of shape's it in? Uh, well, I don't think it's very good, but I'd like you to test it right away. Uh, th this one feature, just this one feature that uh, I've just coded, and it would be really great if you could have a look at it. My answer is not going to be, well, I'm not going to test it until you're ready. But he is ready. When he comes to me and says that, he's ready for me to test that feature. Bring it. I'll happily test the feature. If all you've got is a whiteboard diagram, I'll test that. Oh, there's lots of questions I can ask about the diagram. Hey, are there any other lines that should be there? Are there any other boxes that should be there? What are the boxes inside the boxes? I know when you drew a box there, there's lots of stuff happening in that box, right? Is there any error checking that happens when something comes in there? Is there any error checking on the way out? What might interrupt this box? What might be happening concurrently with this process? Now, as testers, uh, we're often not trained to think systematically about that stuff, but I think we've got to start doing it. Otherwise, we won't get what we want. Another way to get what we want is to identify uh, overtime and slack as sources of really serious risk. Uh, people who are uh, tired uh, tend to make a lot of ma uh, mistakes. They tend to miss a lot of stuff. And they burn out. Also, let's drop the idea of an iteration or a sprint as a contract. This is one of the things that was really awful. See, I'm an old guy, right? I was watching uh, the development of the uh, uh, Agile uh, principles and the uh, Agile uh, manifesto from a bit of a distance, and it looked fantastic at the beginning. It looked really wonderful. What's the first thing they said? People and processes. Uh, sorry, <laughs> individuals and interactions 
over, I'm, it's getting late and I'm tired, I'm burning out, see? Uh, individuals in their actions over processes and tools. That's what they said. I thought, man, that's great. That's so humanist. That's fantastic. And then I go to the Agile testing mailing list, and what's the first thing I see? Uh, what's the best practice to select a tool to implement our Agile process? Uh, back to the future. So um, uh, let's uh, remember one of the most important principles of uh, Agile software development when it first came out. One of the things they highlighted was the significance, the importance of sustainable pace. And that's not, that doesn't mean slow pace, and it doesn't mean crazy velocity. What it does mean is sustainable pace. And let's remember to keep the focus on people instead of uh, uh, processes and tools. Whoops. Whoops, wrong presentation. Good. There we are. Uh, for feature owners, feature owners and managers, uh, sometimes people ask me, how do we motivate our testers to do better work? The first answer is stop demotivating them. People are naturally motivated to do good stuff, to explore, to learn. I mean, testing is one of those things where people are being paid to learn. Imagine that, being paid to learn. You don't usually have to, you don't have to motivate people to learn at all very much. You just have to get out of their way and stop demotivating them. So, in order for testing to be successful, in order to get what we want from testers, testers, I would argue, must have a great deal of freedom, but also responsibility for the quality of their own work. Uh, uh, that's what programmers were lobbying for. In the, er uh, the early days of, the, of Agile, the reason Agile came about was because programmers felt like responsibility was being taken away from them or was being sort of abdicated by them. The early Agilists uh, were very determined. Ward Cunningham and, and uh, uh, Bob Martin and um, uh, Kent Beck, those people were all really interested in saying, no, we are responsible for our product, and we are responsible for the problems in it, too. So we're going to take responsibility for uh, 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 testing it, not so that it's perfect. They didn't make any claims to be perfect. Uh, but Jeff Frederick, another uh, important uh, uh, Agilist back in the day, uh, still these days, of course, uh, he put it really nicely when he said, look, when I give you uh, a code, I'm not guaranteeing that it's going to work. But I am going to provide a pretty strong guarantee that at least it does this. Right? So, and that's something that programmers took on because they wanted responsibility. But in order to get that, they had to assert their freedom. They had to say, we are willing to give you, dear customers, what you want, just not right away. And we would like to have a big uh, hand in the decision of when you're going to get it and uh, in what order you're going to get it because it makes sense to us to build it in a certain kind of order and to give it to you that way so that we can construct it in a robust kind of fashion. So uh, the programmers at that point didn't just sort of accept, oh, well, we got to do what we're told. They, uh, those programmers said, uh, we have to be participants in this. So we need freedom to uh, negotiate with you, dear customer, on how this is going to work. Um, we get into a big mess when we do too much planning. I remember one time I was in, <laughs> I was in India one time, and uh, there was a, a, a tram project that was many, many, many months late. And uh, I was reading an, an interview in the uh, Times of India with this German uh, uh, project manager type who said, uh, what the trouble with them is they need more planning, right? They don't need more. <laughs> well, what, the, what are things like in India? You know, a rainstorm comes along and washes away the roadbed. Uh, there's a, 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 a strike of the construction workers because one of the guys got hit. Uh, by a, a car because the, the conditions around there weren't safe enough. Uh, what else happens? Oh, yeah, uh, um, the whole project gets shut down for three weeks because somebody didn't get the right bribe. What, you can plan your way out of that? I think in software development what we need to think about is mar far less about planning and more or less about preparation so we can respond to change when change happens 
that the one thing that we're going to be able to count on is that change will happen. What we can't count on is how it's going to happen or when. So let's not over overwhelm or rush the developers, and let's not drive the team harder. Our job as testers and the project manager's job as a project manager is to learn about anything, any problem in the product or any problem in the project that would threaten the on-time successful completion of the project. That's what we do as testers. Our job is to reveal problems in the product that would threaten the on-time successful completion of the project. That's what, product, that's what product managers want from us. I've been a product manager. I was a product manager for what was, at the time, the most successful, best-selling piece of software in the world, with the exception of MS-DOS. So uh, the, the, the claim that we were the best-selling piece of software in the world is actually fake, but PC Magazine made that claim in its top ten lists. Uh, they ignored uh, the fact that DOS is being bundled with every computer, but we were the best seller at retail. Uh, QAM M386 and DeskView regularly top the charts. I was program manager for those two products, and that's what I always wanted to know. Is there a problem in the product that means we're not going to make the release date successfully? That's really what I wanted to know. Everything else that the testers were telling me about derived from that fundamental question. What can you tell me about something that would threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? So for feature owners, and by the way, this is a, you know, this is a, a bi-directional thing, right? Feature owners might not necessarily ask us for this, but we can provide it to them. This is what I think that feature owners uh, should uh, uh, require, uh, uh, should desire from testing, uh, should anticipate from testing, even though they don't often uh, get it. Uh, let's keep iterations short and make sure that whatever we're sailing for, make sure that island is still on the horizon before we try to go for islands that are too far away. Um, create product development, small incremental little changes. <sighs> There's one thing the airline industry does that we do not uh, do very well in the software development business. The airline business learns from every problem. Right? Especially aircraft manufacturers, my goodness. And I can prove to you how successful they are at that because of this amazing statistic. I live in Canada. In Canada, and in the United States, and in Mexico, since November 2001, there has not been a single loss of life incident on any of the major airlines coming into or leaving North American airspace. There have been some problems on the regional uh, uh, liners, the small planes, but no loss of life incident, not one, with one exception. And that was in 2014 in San Francisco when an Asiana flight coming in from Korea plowed into an, uh, an abutment uh, in San Francisco. Three young Chinese women died. Why? Because they were not wearing their seat belts. All the people around them in the back of the plane survived. Two of them died in the crash, so we believe. One of them just plain fell out of the plane and got run over by an emergency vehicle. Other than that, airlines flying into and out of North American airspace, have a perfect safety record. Now, a lot of that is luck. But most of it is the professionalism and training of the people who build and maintain and fly and attend the, aircraft, the, uh, 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 the airplanes themselves. That is an unbelievable safety record. And we could have a lot better than we got in software development if we bothered to, as the airline business does, learn from every bug. Testers, how do we get what we want? Let's remember to take good notes. So we remember stuff and we don't forget it. Make sure that our 
the issues that we're having, the problems, the obstacles that we're having, the things that are making testing harder or slower appear on the project risk list. Let's keep talking, debriefs, constant updating. Remember that our job is to help the programmers look good. Right? That's what our job is. Our job is to be a service to the programmers, to the whole team, helping them to look good. But this doesn't mean inflicting help on them, but putting help on them when they don't want it. So we've got to be respectful of that. Another thing we can do is ask, how can tools make my life go faster and more easily? And not just for automated checking. Test leads, test managers, give testers freedom, give them responsibility, give them lots of room to speak up, and testers learn to speak up. Programmers. Without testers' help, you can pair to review each other's code, to develop a shared coding style, uh, to provide scriptable interfaces, to continuously refactor, to make the product easier to maintain and to test. And please, 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 little unit checks. That would help a lot. So you get yourself some rapid feedback. And uh, I think, oh, I'm going to skip this one because it's long enough. Two more, two more things. Here, here are questions that I don't think help us very much, and then I'll give you a list of questions that do. One, are we done yet? Doesn't help. <clears throat> are we ready to ship? Is it good enough? That's, those are not good questions to ask the testers. It's not a, it, it, no, the tester doesn't decide whether it's good enough or not. The tester, seems to me, gives you ideas about why it might not be good enough such that you, dear program manager, make that decision. Testers are not the decision makers. It's not the chest tester's job to decide whether it's good enough or not. How much time do you need to test? That's a silly question. Silly question. A much better question is, uh, uh, what can you do in the time you got available? And what is going to be uncovered uh, if uh, uh, we're working at this kind of pace? How many test cases are passing and failing? <laughs> Stupid question. Test cases don't frame what we need to do with the product, which is to explore it, to investigate it, to make discoveries, to report on it. Test cases are perfectly lousy for that. How many test cases have you run? Silly question. Silly question because a test case is not a unit of measurement. <laughs> I did have one colleague who said, you don't, you don't understand. Look, a test case can have three steps or a test case could have a hundred steps. A test case could look at two conditions or a test case could look at a hundred conditions. Do you get it? Do you understand why it's not useful to ask for test cases like that? And the light went on in the manager's eyes. And the manager said, we get it. We understand. A test case is not a useful way uh, because there can be just a few steps. There can be a whole lot of steps. We get it. We're not going to ask for test cases anymore. The next day they came in and they asked for test steps. How many test steps have you finished? How many bugs are in the product? It's not about the counting, folks. It's about the problems. It's not how many problems are there in the product. It's like, uh, how many things annoy you? <laughs> well, <laughs> how many is not an issue? So when somebody asks you that question, dear testers, answer with this. Here's a list. Here's a list of the top 10, 15, 20, uh, things that I think are most important problems in the product. And I got another 20 after that, and I got another 20 after that, and I got another 20 after that, until you decide the problems that are on my list are not important enough for you. But don't worry about counting them. I will always find problems in the product. It's your job, your program manager, to decide whether those problems are a big deal or not. It's my job to let you know about any problem that I think might threaten the value of the product, and it's not about counting, it's about the list. Much better questions. What's the product story? What can you tell me about important problems in the product? That's a question that, as a program manager, I'm asking. As a tester, I love to hear from a program manager. 
what risks should I be aware of? What bad things might happen, even though we're not sure whether they're going to happen or not? How have you tested the product? What have you done to get the product story? What important testing could we do that we have not done yet? What testing is not scheduled? What testing is not on the horizon that me, we might want to do, even though we haven't uh, uh, got it in this week's task list? What problems are slowing testing down or making things harder? That's a great question for program managers to ask, and it's a great question for testers to train program managers to ask. What help do you need to speed things up? What specific aspects of testing are taking time? How do your tests connect to the mission of testing? The fundamental question of testing, fundamental question that testing can help program managers to answer, what problems threaten? the on-time successful completion of the project. And that's all I got for tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> Although I am willing to answer some questions. Anybody have any questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. You are? Ivan, hello. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Have you tried it? Have you tried it? Then how do you know? Now, you see, there is one uh, thing that you might want to do before you introduce those questions. What you might want to do is you might want to declare what you believe are reasonable commitments that you can make, things that you're capable of doing uh, that frame what your position is, what your role is in the project. So here's a list. First of all, I provide a service to you, dear program manager. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you out. Same with the developers. I provide a service. And you're an important client of that service, and I'm not happy until you're happy. Okay? I will not, <laughs> I will not cease from mental fight, nor throw my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem. Oh, no, wrong meeting, sorry. Um, I'm not happy unless you're happy. I'm not going to stop testing. I'm not going to stop trying to help you out until you are satisfied with the service that I provided. Second, I'm not the gatekeeper of quality. Dear program manager, you are. You get to decide. That's why they made you program manager. That's what it means to be a program manager. You are responsible for the quality of the product and the project. I am not. It's my job to shine light on things that would inform that decision for you. That's what I do. Um, I don't own quality. I don't seize authority for quality from the programmers, right? Uh, James Bach puts this, where he, there's an interview where he talks about this. He says, you know what, when I was a young uh, a tester and I had the title, title quality assurance, I said, well, it's my job to care about quality. You know why I get that job? Because I'm the quality assurance person. I care. You guys don't care. You guys don't care about quality. I care. Well, can you imagine, what, you know, if you talk like that, no programmer will talk to you, right? And rightly so, they'd be right not to talk to you. Uh, they do care about quality. What they might not care about is exactly the same things you care about. And it's reasonable for that, for them to, to feel that way because they're given different incentives. They're given diff different kinds of motivation. It's my job as a tester to help shine light on how the programmers are being disincentivized, right? Not being given an incentive uh, to uh, go a little more slowly, a little more carefully. That, that's part of my job. I, I can help the programmers that way. Programmer, product manager, both my friends. I'm trying to help them, not to seize control from them. Um, I commit to testing code as soon as I get it or testing anything else you give me as soon as I get it. Anything you give me, I'm willing to test it. I'm willing to look critically at it and try to find problems in it. Uh, I'll strive to test in a way that allows you to move along as fast as possible. I refuse to be a bottleneck for the project. 
Um, I'll do, you know, even if I have only limited information and limited time, I will test as fast as I can. Even if I, even if I don't have everything I want, uh, I'll let you know about how it might help, but I'm not going to bitch about it. I'm not going to just gripe about it. I'm going to try to get around those problems, and I'm going to ask for help. And I'll let you know how that might affect the, uh, the project. I'll learn about the project as fast as I can, and I'll feed that back into my testing so that I can test more cleverly. I will test the most important things first, and I'll try to find the most important problems. I will draw to your attention problems that you might not think are important. I'll try to explain to you why I think they're important, just in case we're not in alignment with each other on that stuff. Uh, I will act in the interest of everybody in the project, everybody whose opinions matter, so that everybody can make better decisions about the project. I will be respectful. I'll deliver clear, readable, uh, uh, um, understandable, or, or articulate, right? M maybe it'd be even more efficient for me just to describe the problem to a developer and say, here, oh, <laughs> right? No need for a bug report, right? No need to put the damn thing in JIRA and let it get buried or, or let it get to be yet another item on our long list of problems. Maybe that might be the most efficient way to handle things, so I'll do it that way. Um, and I'm not going to step into the designer's shoes either. I'm not going to say that I'm responsible for the design of the project. The project has to work the way I say it does. I'm not going to do that. I'll uh, talk about my testing, and I will invite your feedback, and I'll feed that back into my testing process. And I'll also let you know about things that you can change in the project or the, project that, or, or the uh, product that will make it easier to test. I'll handle any special requests you give to me. And I will also say, so how would you like me to juggle this against the other things that I'm, I'm supposed to be doing? Help me understand what my priorities are in order to serve you best. I refuse to waste your time. I'm not going to waste your time. Oh, or at least I won't do it uh, uh, carelessly. I might do it by mistake. And if I do, I'll apologize, and I'll try not to make that mistake again. I will not mislead you. If you ask me to do something where, that I think will mislead you, I will push back on that. I will resist misleading you because misleading you is not a service that I offer. My job is to help you not to be fooled, not to help fool you. I'll try to offer something more helpful when you ask for something misleading. Now, if you start with that, if you start with those premises, and if you start with the idea that... Um, you know, test case counts are the second silliest thing that we do as testers. The first being passing and failing test case ratios. Maybe defect detection uh, uh, ratios. That's pretty stupid, too. Uh, but uh, uh, those numbers are guaranteed to mislead. So when somebody asks me for them, it's, like, it's kind of like a drunk asking for the keys, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, just give me the keys. No, you're too drunk. Uh, I'm not going to give you your keys. Oh, but I got to drive home. Uh, all right. Uh, how about I? How about I go with you? <laughs> right. If somebody is going to do something that where I think it's dangerous, I'll offer to go with them. Right. But I won't grab the wheel from them. I won't grab the wheel from them unless they, you know, pass out completely. Uh, in which case, I'll try to put the car in neutral and then get it slowed down and park it. Right. Um, but uh, um, I, you're not going to get fired. You're, uh, and put it this way, if somebody wants to fire you from acting like a responsible, helpful professional, then let them fire you because you don't want to work for them. Right? Really, seriously, you don't want to work for them. You want to go somewhere where your services are honored, right? So... I would suggest very strongly uh, uh, do that. But I don't, think, I don't think you run any kind of risk of being fired if you're clear about your commitments and that your commitment is to help the project as much as possible. Give it a try. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> if, it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't work out for you, I got a big network. Uh, I'll, you know, if I, if I, whenever I've heard about somebody who got uh, uh, into a, a position that they didn't like, my first job, my first commitment is to try to help them out. 
I got 16,000 people following me on Twitter. I bet a few of them are from Ukraine. <laughs> and I bet a lot of them, in the ones in Ukraine, are going, ah, can I find pastors who are really, really good? So if you do that, you get, you, if anybody gets fired, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can to uh, uh, provide them with a, uh, a contact, at least, and then publicity. They're looking for work. I, I, I don't name names either, you know. I, I know a good tester in Dmitro uh, Petrovsk who's looking for work. And it's, they don't need to know who it is until they ask me for it. So, um, But, you know, that's one thing I would actually suggest that you do really strongly is build a community, build a network. Do exactly what you're doing here. Do exactly what you're doing here. And spread the word about places people shouldn't want to work if there are places like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, that's a big one. Um, what uh, uh, some great places to start uh, would include um, uh, unhumbly, because it's the first thing that comes to mind. Of course, uh, is that my own blog. James Box blog, uh, Kem Kaner's uh, black box software testing class, the online uh, version of it. It's getting a little old, uh, the version that's online uh, publicly and freely available, but it's still really solid stuff. Um, in terms of uh, books, I guess, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I should probably produce one. I've got a library thing account. Uh, the library thing is a... Uh, uh, something that indexes your, your library and, and uh, lets you know about it. But here's a few. Here's a few. Uh, number one, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, fantastic book for testers to read. It's all about these little mistakes that people make when they think, uh, people including us, um, it's, it's ways in which we fool ourselves. Um, another book by um, uh, Daniel Levitin comes to mind called The Organized Mind. Uh, which is about how to do little things that help you uh, uh, to become more productive. Jerry Weinberg's book, An Introduction to General Systems Thinking. Uh, a fantastic book. Uh, Jerry's book, uh, Perfect Software and Other Illusions About Testing. Um, the, uh, uh, the book, uh, Alex, where's Alex? Alex is uh, here earlier. Maybe he's gone. Uh, where's Alex? And the, you know, it, the, of course, here, 19 hands go up, right? Where's Alex? Um, but uh, uh, Alex is uh, in the middle of reading uh, Lessons Learned in Software Testing. Again, a book that's about 16 years old. Other than the fact that it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't talk, talk about modern software, the ideas about testing that are in it have stood the test of time and will continue to do so for quite a while. Um, on uh, scientific thinking, who boy, uh, lots of things. Herbert Simon's uh, books, uh, Harry Collins's books on how science works, the Gollum books. Um, one's called the Gollum, which is what everybody needs to know about science. Uh, it, and it's especially about science as a, a predominantly social activity. The second, uh, uh, the Gollum at large, how to think about technology has a really, really interesting section in it on uh, the weird interplay between uh, a demonstration and experiment. And sometimes a demonstration, as we all know, right? We've been to the demos, right? We know what happens when somebody tries to demo the product. Whoops, it turns into an experiment all of a sudden. We, we, we thought it was just going to be a demonstration. And then sometimes it, it turns out if we look at a demonstration, although it uh, was not... Um, uh, look at an experiment, uh, sometimes it goes pathological. Uh, we, we, we have the, all these checks, and we think of them as little experiments that are being run on the pro product, but actually they're, they're more like demonstrations. So he, he writes, uh, Harry Collins and Trevor Pinch write this wonderful uh, uh, section, about six pages in the middle of that book. You can get it as an e-book uh, that talks about the, the interplay between ex ex uh, um, experiment and demonstration. That's really, really cool. Um, but uh, for a more detailed answer, all of my presentations come with lifetime free technical support. 
so if you have a question that rises from this talk, um, uh, you don't have to ask it right here, right now. You can absolutely drop me a line in email. I'm at Michael Bolton on Twitter. Uh, I'm Michael Bolton on any part of the internet or the web, except you've got to remember to put in testing, or otherwise you get that singer guy. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I'm I'm happy to follow up. But those are just a few. Those are little a few little nuggets there. Anybody else? Yes. Hey, Sergey. That's a, a really wonderful question. What's, what's my biggest fuck-up? Uh, what I remember as my biggest fuck-up um, was when we were at Quarterdeck developing uh, a form, uh, a, a feature of QAMM386. It was sort of an add-on to it called Magnaram. And uh, Magnaram was an interesting kind of technology. You've got to think back to the time when computers had four or eight megabytes of memory on them. That's mega with an M, you know, that, that kind of megabyte, right? That megabyte uh, of memory. And um, uh, this feature did not work terribly well. Uh, and in fact, weirdly, uh, uh, the more you needed it, the more you needed it, kind of, you know? Um, but the more you needed it, the more underpowered a machine you had, the worse it worked. It worked much better on machines that had at least some slack. You know, 16 megabytes of memory, 32 megabytes of memory. And uh, we were under pressure from a competitor for a while <laughs> until we found out that the competitor actually did nothing. It literally did not work. You installed it, and it told you, See, you have four megabytes of memory on your machine. And then after the installation process, it would say, you have eight megabytes of memory on your machine because of the service that this program was doing. It, didn't, it wasn't doing anything. And we were adamant that our program you know, should do something. And it turns out that uh, the technology involved, th this is a bit of a, a technological explanation, but uh, the idea was to take a little bit of working memory on the system and turn that into a compressed cache before you had to go out to the hard drive for virtual memory. Okay? So uh, there's memory, which is nice and fast, and then there's virtual memory on the disk, which is about 10, 000, you know, one ten thousandth the speed, much, much slower. This is nanoseconds. This is uh, microseconds or milliseconds. So um, uh, what we would do is we would take some of the working memory, which is really fast, and we would use it uh, in a place where we could compress the data that was going in there so that less data would have to make the trip out to the, to the drive. So we could compress and uncompress uh, 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 data in here, making it available to here, so it, instead of going all the way out to the drive, which is super slow. And uh, our biggest fuck up and I was absolutely a participant in this, I was a program manager for the product at the time, uh, was to convince ourselves that the important thing was to find examples of this product working effectively. Right? To, to show that this product worked really well. So we created arbitrarily uh, these uh, data sets uh, that where compression was really easily e easy, like uh, big BMP files, right? Uh, there's there's no compression there, so uh, we said, well, if you got Photoshop and if you got a four megabyte machine, and you happen to be working with a one megabyte uh, file, well, then you can get that sucker down to I don't know 50k or something like that, and it's really fast, and you don't have to go to the swap file. In other words, we found these rare instances where the product was providing value, and most of the time it wasn't really. 
but we were fooling ourselves into believing that that's what our job was. Fortunately, the director of development uh, caught up with the guys who were uh, uh, producing this thing, and he says, well, we're desperate. We've got to find something. What he found was that comp uh, the compression algorithm was much slower than it needed to be. So we optimized the snot out of that. He, he, he went out and he studied uh, uh, compression algorithms uh, very rapidly, very quick study, and uh, uh, made the compression algorithm uh, many hundreds of times faster overnight. And that made it a little better, a little better. But the, the trouble with that product was uh, the worse you needed it, the worse it worked. And so my, my greatest mistake, uh, I think, was uh, uh, in trying to uh, convince myself and the rest of the team that all we needed to do was find a few good cases rather than saying, you know what, let's just not, let's just, it, let's make sure that the minimum system requirements for this is something where it will work reasonably well. Oops. Right? But that's a, that was a great case of self-deception. What a great job we can do if we can find that rare case where this thing is actually useful. We shouldn't have done that. Fortunately, that was a long time ago. All the bodies are buried now. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was 20 years ago. Uh, but that's, that's the biggest mistake I think I ever made. Showing that the product works. Never do that, testers. At that point, you'd, you'd, you'd like lose, your, lose your, your tester club card, you know, if you, if you do that. That's what happened to me. A dark day in my history. A stain on my reputation. But you get over it. Great question. Thank you. Any more questions? If you have them, again, uh, 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 at Michael Bolton on Twitter, uh, uh, Michael at developsense.com, or even uh, anybody you like at developsense.com, or even anybody you like at michaelbolton.net. Right? So that guy at michaelbolton.net. Um, not .com. That's the singer again, right? Um, but uh, um, uh, if you have uh, questions, of course, I'm still here for a little while uh, and uh, thirsty, so I'll be sticking around for a bit. Um, meanwhile, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your uh, attendance and your kind attention. Thank you. <laughs>